Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Bite Size Talk. I'm very happy that with me is uh, Simon Heumus from the Cubic in Tübingen, and he is going to talk about a NFCore pipeline called NFCore Pan Genome. Off to you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Francesca. I'm happy to be here. I will talk about cluster scalable punch and graph construction with NFCore Pan Genome. Uh, thanks to advances in sequencing technologies, very high quality genome assemblies will become basically default in the near future. And then this will offer us an opportunity to study genomic variation as never seen before. However, how can we represent and work with hundreds of genomes at the gigabase scale? And one solution here could be so-called pan genome. Uh, it is able to model an entire set of genomic ele elements in a population. In contrast to reference-based genomic approaches, where we relate all the sequences to one linear consensus model of the genome, pan genomic relates each new sequence to all other sequences represented in this pan genome. And in particular, this helps us to mitigate reference bias. Now, how can such a pan genomic data structure look like? And one way here is to encode it in a graphical data structure. As you already know, in the linear genome world, we take the reference genome and augmented with variation. However, a pan genome graph now can compress the shared and variant sequences into one graphical representation. And in these pan genome graph models, DNA sequences are incorporated as nodes, then with edges connecting the nodes as they occur as sequences representing the graph. Basically, this uh, visualize, visualizing variation that you can see here in this figure. Also, if now sequences represent identical regions, such as paralogs or orthologs, then they will share actually the same nodes, while the variants will be added as new branches in the graph. Like what you can see are the insertions, same letter change, or inversion. We can also visualize such a punching graph in a tube map like way. So let's stay there for a moment to get a better idea of a specific um, punch genome graph model or implementation, which is called a variation graph. And here the idea is that actually all our sequences are paths that go through the nodes. And these paths can be contexts, haplotypes, reads, or even whole chromosomes. In this example, you can see two genomes and actually they share some sequence. So they both actually visit this node number one because they have the same sequence, but then their sequence diverges, and so they both visit different nodes. Um, this is a cool visualization. However, if we have hundreds of genomes, it can become hard to read. And so the idea is that we can actually project this into a 1D visualization. What we do actually is we just concatenate all the nodes, nucleotides, into a so-called pan-genomic sequence, and then we write it from left to right which you can see below in this figure. And then with a binary matrix, you can actually encode the genomic sequences from both genomes. So if um, the sequence is present within the genome, then we just draw the color. And if not, then it's actually not drawn. Now the question is, how can we scale this up to potentially gigabase scale pan genome graphs? And here the idea is actually binning. So, here you can see a large scale punch and graph 1D visualization of a certain HLA DRB1 gene from the HLA region in human. And what we are doing here is basically the same. We again arrange the nodes of the graph from left to right to find the punch node sequence. And if there's a coloring, then the path has that sequence. But if there's no color, then actually the path does not have the sequence. We can place the path names on the left and Basically, what we are now missing are the edges, but we draw them as black lines on the paths to so, um, visualize somehow the graph topology. And the key idea here is binning. So, of course, one pixel now represents hundreds or even thousands of nucleotides. And so <clears throat> we bin them basically together, and that's how we can visualize these large graphs. What is not clearly understandable here is the graph topology. So there actually is also a way to visualize these things in two dimensions. This is extremely important to 
easily grasp last structure variations, but also to take a look at certain kind of bubbles, which can indicate regions where paths highly diverge or maybe could be hinting at the representative flow side. Now, these are the key concepts to understand all the visualizations that are coming in this presentation. Now, the question is, how can we build such graphs? And what already exists is the so-called PGGP algorithm. It's called the Punch Genome Graph Builder Pipeline. <clears throat> and it basically comes with three major um, steps. The first one is the all versus all alignment step. So as input, we have uh, your sequences in a fast A format. And then we do an all versus all alignment, which is quadratic, so it can be quite heavy. And then basically here it is visualized what you will get out of it. Once you have these alignments, we can use secrish to actually use this kind of alignment graph to fold it together into a variation graph. So the idea is that when we have the aligned sequences and they sure share certain subparts of the pairwise aligned sequences, then we can collapse these together into a node in this variation graph. The third major step is uh, a normalization step. What we do here is we take this raw variation graph, we sort it, sort it uh, in one dimension. So basically we sort it so that the 1D layout is guided by the nucleotide path positions given in the graph. And we then normalize it by applying local MSAs across windows of this punch genome graph. So what we obtain in the end is this smoothed graph. And usually in PGGP, this is done uh, around three times. Because at the edges of these windows, we also need to ensure that things fit together. Then we remove some, um, and some redundant nodes. Um, and we are also able to uh, call variants against any path in the graph. So it, 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 you can choose your reference of choice or any other genome you are interested in. Additionally, we also provide, or this tool provides graph statistics, 1D and 2D visualizations, which are all aggregated in the MyTQC report. And the PGTB algorithm was already used to build uh, one draft human punch genome reference graph. Uh, this was published in Nature this year, I think. And therefore, it, it's um, already really well tested. How, um, however, it comes with the caveat that currently it's a bash script. There is also a Docker, one huge Docker container for it, but it's only able to utilize one node at the moment. So it's hard to scale up. And that's why I then uh, choose to implement the NFCore Punch Genome Pipeline. What you see here in the middle is its core workflow. And it's basically directly the same workflow that I just showed you. It's the PGGB workflow. However, now I implemented some new features to make it faster or more scalable across the cluster. So one major bottleneck when you have a huge amount of input sequences are the all versus all alignments because they are quite tragic. And so what's possible now is that we just do first an all versus all approximate mapping. And then we split these into chunks, let's say, for example, 20. And then for each of these chunks, we can run this the heavy base level alignment in parallel across nodes of the cluster. And this then leads to a much shorter runtime for this step. All the following steps then are uh, as already presented. Another interesting feature is uh, what we call community detection. So when you have um, like an input of an organism and you know it has comes with, let's say, eight chromosomes, but you input all the sequences from all chromosomes and you did not uh, know in advance which sequence belongs to which chromosome, the idea is that we can do this automatically. So here, what we can do is that we do an all versus all approximate mapping, and then we translate this into a network. And from this network, we can apply this Leiden clustering algorithm to then detect all our communities so that by expectation, we expect eight communities when we input eight chromosomes, right? And so for each of uh, these communities, we then can execute the whole workflow again. 
once all of them were run through, we can combine them again back into one huge graph. So they all stay in one file and we can calculate the statistics and visualizations of the final graph. Yeah. That's how the pipeline works in general. And let's take a quick look at what comes out in the MITQC report, because I think it's a little bit more customized compared to what you usually observe um, in, in the, your daily pipelines you do with like RNA seek or so forth. So um, I implement an OCHI MITQC module, which basically takes the OCHI stats table and then neatly visualizes certain features of the graph, like the name, the length in nucleotides, the number of nodes, edges, paths, and number of components. So assuming now we, as input, we had given an organism with eight chromosomes and the humanity detection worked really well, then you would expect something like eight components here because you would have eight distinct graphical components in your full graph. Of course, what you can also see is the number of bases. And what you can also optionally do is like add here something like percent N or percent CG content if you're interested. <clears throat> the report also comes with lots and lots of visualizations so that you can better understand how your graph looks like and if if it actually made sense what you did and maybe if you need some parameter tweakage or something like that. What you see on top here is the so-called compressed 1D visualization. And here the idea is that we collapse all of our paths together into one row and then indicate by color coding like a heat map where a huge amount of paths actually have that sequence, like here in blue, or here in red. This basically means that this is a very unique sequence and this is not seen so often in the whole graph. So imagine you have like thousands of paths later in your graph. This can give you a great overview of where um, homologous regions are or where really unique regions are in your graph. This default 1D visualization I already told you about. And here, the 1D visualization is colored by path position. This means light gray is a very low nucleotide position within that path. And black basically is the highest uh, nucleotide path position. What's interesting here is that this path compared to all the others actually goes the other way around. And so it's the reverse complement. And this is because uh, it apparently was assembled in a different way, like maybe from a different uh, chromosomal strand compared to all the other sequences. Here, the information is basically the same. So all of these nodes are traversed in forward orientation, except here this for this one, it's traversed in reverse, and that's why it's colored in red. Other 1D visualizations that are by default in the MultiQC report uh, are visualization by node depth. So gray means that the node is visited once. But here in red, actually, it means that uh, this node is visited twice. So this helps us to detect um, like repeat regions or, or otherwise uh, complex regions in the graph. <clears throat> As we have seen in the statistics table, we have some ends in the graph and we can also highlight them in green. And so specifically, apparently only this path has some ends in it, which are then here. To get then an overview of the topology of the graph, we also have a 2D drawing in the MultiQC report. Now let's take a look at some real life examples when we actually apply the pipeline. I did that to an organism called Lodoromyces elongisporus. It's a very underestimated yeast fungi pathogen. And like when old people with a weak immune system somehow are infected with this, they can die within days. And so this can be quite an issue. And this, uh, uh, like Dolyromyces elongisporus, short Lodelo, comes with eight chromosomes and some mtDNA. And the input of the graph that I will show you are 11 assemblies from this Winter Wet Lab School this year. And they were generated from nanopore and Illumina data. Two of them were fully assembled, and the other nine ones are still uh, on the Conti Club, basically. 
What I first did is that I applied the pipeline in this community detection mode. And the good news was that, hey, we have eight chromosomes plus the mtDNA, and we also get nine communities. So this is amazing. And also most chromosomes are linear. Um, however, some of these have these very long thin tails like here or here. And this is unmapped sequence. And this was somehow strange and not ideal. Also this chromosome B and especially chromosome H are not very linear. And so I was not happy with the result. So what we tried next is something called reference guided community detection. What we did here is that we took the, all of the reference sequences, which are each one sequence per chromosome. And then we mapped or aligned all the context of all the other sequences to that reference. And then we were able to actually place each of these into their respective community. And so for each community, I then ran NF Propan genome. This is the result. And in general, most chromosomes now look much more linear. Even chromosome B looks beautiful now. However, chromosome H uh, uh, still looks messy. And so the next step was then that we got back to the assembly team. And they actually told us, hey, we see some interaction between chromosomes C, H, uh, and G. And so we just put all of these sequences together into one graphical component. And voila, we have our beautiful graph here, actually. We currently think that this is due to some RDNA region, which somehow um, forms this interaction of these different chromosomes. <clears throat> I also told you something about cluster scalable. So let's take a look at an um, E. coli graph of over 2,000 sequences. Here, the quadratic all versus all alignment problem actually becomes a problem. So I ran WF mesh map. It takes one hour, 30 minutes. That's really good. However, when I do a WF mesh align, it takes 1,000 times 20 minutes, and it generates over 600 gigabytes of path files. And this means that sub subsequently, unsurprisingly, Sequish then run out of scratch disk space. And so I thought maybe I can actually use our network storage to build the raw graph but it was so slow, it wasn't doable. So luckily there's an option WF mesh that allows us to retain only a subset of all the mappings. And it is uh, configured in a way that although we get less mappings for the um, base level alignment step, the idea is that we will still get one huge graphical component. So we can still get a really, really decent graph out of it. And after doing this, WF mesh aligned and took 100 times five minutes, so much faster than before, much less resources required. However, with the default settings now, Sequish complained about not having enough RAM. So there's another parameter there, which I decreased by two orders of magnitude. Basically, the idea is that it uses less RAM, but it takes longer. And so after five hours, I had my raw E. coli punch genome graph. Now, smooth XG on such a huge graph uh, can really take its time. And so after 62 hours, I did one round of smoothing. And I couldn't do more rounds because of the seven days um, time limit on our cluster. So here, um, there's still somehow potential maybe to improve the tool smooth XG itself to make it more cluster scalable. There are ideas for this, but it directly involves to code in C++ and not to some optimization steps here in the NF core function graph pipeline. Here you can see the resulting graph. And again, we have this compressed mode and you can see a huge amount of links. So the, all of these black lines, each of them is a, an edge. And because we have so many edges in this graph, basically everything becomes black here. And that's because the bacteria interchange and change their genes with each, with each other, right? A huge amount of times. And they also put the genes at different positions in their respective genomes. And that's why this is such a mess. And this also explains this uh, in 2D, this hairy ball down here, because we have so many interactions between different regions, 
of the different E. coli genomes. That um, it, it's really hard to to see what's going on. But what we can say for sure here, for example, is that there's a the like the majority of the sequences in the sponge genome are actually covered by let's say basically all of these sequences, and then there are some unique sequences or roughly unique sequences in there. But you can also see here on the left-hand side in this 2D visualization are these tiny graphical components. And basically these are sequences that did not align to any other sequence in this huge blob here. Yeah, I think that's all I wanted to tell you. And uh, I want to thank all of these people here. They all helped me out a lot. And yeah, thanks for having me and thanks for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. So um, I am now allow allowing people to unmute themselves and also to um, start a video. So if there are any questions, please um, ask them now. Um, in the meantime, uh, I was wondering what is happening after this pipeline. Let's say you have your pan genome. What are you going to do with the data? And yeah, what is it going to be used for? Yeah, that's a good question. It, um, I think it also depends on the use case. So for example, with the load load data, you can take a look at all these SVs and how the chromosomes interact. So if you're interested in chromosomal interaction, this can help on large structure variation detection, but also you can take the graph and it will improve your mapping. For example, if you the HLA region human is really diverse, and if you have short reads and specifically map them to a punch genome graph, which already has lots of variation in there, then it can improve your mapping, mm -hmm. for example. And you can do sort of, um, all kinds of things in downstream analysis uh, with a tool called OCHI. So you can detect complex regions or for example, what you can also do is then um, create a, a phylogenetic tree, for example, to get an idea of how close the sequences actually are that you what what you've created the punch genome graph from. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the audience? It seems everyone is happy. Then I would like to thank you again for this really nice talk. Uh, I would like to thank the audience for listening in and as usual, the Jan Zagerberg Initiative for funding bite-sized talks. So thank you everyone. Thank you, bye.